It is a Saturday morning in 1994, and I am being recruited to SC. I am having coffee in the president's office. My partner, Barry, and I are interested enough in the place, and they are interested enough in me, that they have asked me to return. Steve Sample seems like a nice guy. I've met a fair amount of presidents, and, and he seems different, more down to earth. We end our meeting and he says, great things are happening here. You can be part of it. This will not be business as usual. I hope you come here. I thank him, but say that to be honest, I'm hesitant about Los Angeles. The recent earthquake doesn't bother me, but I don't like driving. <laughs> and all those freeways. Penn State, where I am, is so much easier to navigate. Could you work on lessening the congestion, I say? <laughs> and he laughs and he says he'll try. <laughs> Barry and I go home to State College and we debate the pros and cons of moving to Los Angeles. We have to decide what to do. We need a sign. I still worry about traffic and congestion. I walk into our house, and Barry has just turned on the TV. Bill, look at this, he says. We see the 405 freeway, and except for a white Ford Bronco, <laughs> it's empty. The whole freeway is empty. Barry looks at me and he says, that Steve Sample is a powerful guy. <laughs> we accept and we come out here. <laughs> One day early on, I have a question for the president. Ann Westfall grows used to my voice over the years and she says, I'm sure Steve will get back to you in a day or two. On a Saturday morning at 7 a.m., the phone rings, and I hear, this is Steve Sample calling for Bill Tierney, 7 a.m. I need some advice, advice a while later. We are home on a Friday evening at 10 o'clock, and Barry picks up the phone. He mouths to me, it's the president. I'm not sure which is more amazing that the president of the university has bothered to call me at 10 o'clock on a Friday night, or if we're actually talking about the pros and cons of revenue-centered management at 10 o'clock in the evening. I hang up the phone and Barry says, does that guy ever sleep? <laughs> Indeed. I am sitting in the Burbank airport one morning around 6 a.m. trying to hide behind the Los Angeles Times, and I hear that voice. Hello, Bill. I look up and there is Steve, dressed impeccably and ready to engage in conversation. There are sad times, too. Matthew Shepard, a gay college student, is murdered on a lonely Wyoming road, and the reverberation is felt all the way to Los Angeles. People are scared. Students are scared. I call Steve and suggest that he make some sort of statement. Boom, a note comes out about what we value as an academic community. A student calls me and says, did you see it? Did you see what the president wrote? We see the same action after 9-11 for the Muslim community. And always, quietly, when a Trojan is ill, or tragedy strikes. There are silly moments, too. A waiter asks what he would like for lunch, and he says with that white napkin tucked in under his chin, I'd like the burger and fries, but Catherine would find out, so I'll have the turkey on whole wheat. <laughs> there are melancholy times. I am in his office once again asking for advice, and he tells me at the end of the meeting on a quiet morning that he has Parkinson's. He jokes that he hopes it doesn't affect his drumming. 
A few weeks later, he lets the community know. And I hope that I can do that if I need to someday. Steve is always a class act. Now it is the millennium. I am president of the Academic Senate. I pen one or another resolution. And Steve not only copy edits my work for an errant comma or semicolon, but he writes thoughtful, argumentative responses on why he can or cannot support something I've proposed on behalf of the faculty. He is always willing to engage, but it must be respectful. And then a month ago, Steve is going to give his last address to the faculty. I am so busy that morning. I have so many meetings, so many students to see. But I give thought to skipping it. Do I really need to hear another speech? But at the last moment, I slip in the side door and I watch a man who has worked so hard for so many years. And I hear him as my president the last time. Now, as academics, we are trained in the art of critique. We know what's wrong with an argument. We look for flaws in ideas, and of consequence, we will tell you what's wrong with our lives as well. The endless meetings, the bureaucracy, the colleague who drones on and on, the salary. I could go on forever. <laughs> what we do not talk about very much is what makes this life worthwhile. The student whose eyes light up in class because she got the concept you've been trying to convey. The graduate student in orals who knows the topic better than you now and can parry back the toughest of questions. The idea you have been stuck on for days and days and finally you find the right words to write. I think of all these things when I watch Steve give his final address. For here is a man who worked so hard that he has inspired us to work hard too. He has walked his talk, and in doing so, whether it is at 7 a.m. or 10 p.m., whether it is in his office or at an airport waiting room, he has done so with respect, with humor, with inquisitiveness, with courtesy, that I cannot help but feel terrifically proud to have chosen the academic life. Terrifically proud to have chosen life as a Trojan. And terrifically proud to have chosen to work with Steve, even if he cannot keep the freeways empty for me all of the time. Thank you.